Thank you. Um, if you take my life, I have these mentors that I work with, and some of them have been CEOs of really, really big companies. And part of what I'm going to talk about is how to get those mentors. But I have these mentors of, you want to have me over here? OK, that's fine. <laughs> Don't. OK, so go. Um, so I have these mentors that I work with and across my companies. One of those people is a guy called uh, Valdemar Smith, who used to be the CEO of a company called ISS. How many people know ISS? Um, so this is like a 500,000 person company. And so one of the things I realized that if you run a company with 500,000 people, you're not actually doing a job. You're not actually doing a role in a job. But what you do is you set the right framework for people to be successful in their job. So really what you do is a lot of what Daniel was talking about, which is you set the purpose of the organization, you set the mission, and you set the vision, you set the strategy, you set the direction of the company. That's not the same as setting the strategy in what you do here in strategic class at CBS. That's much more fundamental. But as a business, if you want to have a path, you need to have a strategy in place, you need to have a vision, a mission, so that the organization, whenever they're faced with a decision, know what to choose. But that's no difference for how we are as people. As people, and that's why I thought what Daniel said was really, really relevant. As people, we also need to know where we're heading because we're faced with directions every day. A simple direction, the second, which is, should we do network and drinks or should we go home and study, right? And should those drinks turn into a night out? Um, so we're faced with those kind of decisions all the time. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk a little bit about my student time here at CBS, but I'm going to talk mostly about the learnings that I take away. Um, the one problem that you sometimes have is you back solve for solutions. So these are realizations that I have getting out of the school. Um, it should also be said that I was extremely lucky. So I don't recommend people to follow and do what I do, even if they decided to have and want to have the same results as I have, because there's a lot of luck involved in these things. My great-grandfather became the CEO of what was called Private Bank, which became Nodea later. And I remember asking my, grandfather, my, my father, and I said, sort of, how did he become the CEO of a bank? And he said, because he drove the, the chairman to work every day. No, that's not enough. What has to happen is the CEO has to leave his job as well for you to get that role. So there's a lot of luck involved. You have to be in the right position at the right time with the right circumstances. But I'm going to talk about some of the fundamental things, I think, that didn't necessarily work for me. Some of these things I didn't actually do. But in retrospect, I would have liked to have done them because I think I could have achieved even better results than I did. Um, I'm not going to talk about family life. I think that's for other people to talk about. I'm not going to talk about how to have the most and drink the most beers because if I drink just a few beers, I get really easily wasted. Um, but what I am going to talk about is something I know a little bit about, which is how to build a career. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about the gift because I think we have an extremely big gift. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, how many here in here can read? OK, it's pretty good. Anyone in here who cannot read, which is fair? Dyslexia is a commonality among entrepreneurs. OK, that's a pretty good start. So how many here? Good. So how many in here read so far this year? We've had five weeks. So how many in here read five books outside of school this year so far? A couple of people. Good New Year resolution. Congratulations. I want to hire all of you. Um, so the fact is that we can read, right? And I don't want to ask how many people read because you're reading in school, right? But the minute you get out of school, most people actually don't read at more, anymore at all. Most people don't read any books out of sort of uh, literature, but nobody reads sort of books that actually teach them something they didn't know before. So the fundamental thing we have to think about is, are we better off being able to read and not reading than somebody who cannot read? Or put it in a different way, you guys are going through first class education. You're going through one of the best educations there are in the world called CBS. It's a really, really fucking good school. Because I travel around the world. I've tried to hire people in Indonesia, Nigeria, in Mexico. And the quality of the people that exit this school is second to none. It is really one of the best schools, I think, of business schools in the world. But the question is the same as before, which is if you don't apply yourself, meaning if you don't live up to the potential of what you can do with that education, then is it really worth having it all? In the same way that if you're able to read and you don't read, is that really worth it at all as well? So what I'm saying is you guys have a gift. And the gift is that you're in the school. Now, in my world, those gifts come with great opportunity, but it also comes with great responsibility. And so the responsibility is not about a war in Syria and refugees coming in and people having it worse than you. It's about the billion people starving every single day around the world. It's about the kids dying from disease that we could fix. And so if we don't do some of the things that I'm going to mention, some of the things Daniel mentioned, some of the other things, what we're not just doing is we're not just cheating ourselves. We are actually cheating the world of what we could deliver. And that's why this is really important. This is not about money. 
though monetary results are sometimes a result of value that you generate for the world and a good reflection of that value that you generate. There are many ways to generate and reflect value outside of money, but it's a good reflection, it's a good scoreboard. But you're here because you've been given a massive opportunity and we need to make sure you add that value to the rest of the world. My goal for the next, um, I guess, 13 to 12 minutes, whatever I have left now, is to add value to one person. I don't try to add value to more. It was ironic, actually. I, to be honest, I had a completely different presentation. I threw out the entire presentation because I met a, a guy. I was, I was walking from Sulbert Place over here. I met a guy we'd given a job offer to who had decided to reject it. And I realized that he shouldn't have rejected the job offer. And I realized he wasn't the first one. And by the way, 99% of everybody we give job offers to usually reject it, not, uh, but, but, but not because it's not a great opportunity, but just because it doesn't reflect the normal path that people choose. It doesn't reflect the, I'm gonna go into M&A, then I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna join TDC, I'm gonna join Dung. It represents something different. It represents a certain amount of risk, I think, in people's minds more than in reality. But, so I decided to actually rewrite the entire speech because I, th I think it was much more fundamental to talk about some of the things that you can actually do and some of the mindset that you need to have. But that's my goal. I don't expect more people than just one. This is my absolute hope um, that I can do that. I just wanna clarify one thing. All I do is I build companies. I don't invest, that's what I do. I've done a lot of things before. I worked for McKinsey, I went to MIT and all those things. But what I do today is I build companies. I wanna come back to in a second of why I don't build startups, but why I build companies. But let me come back to that in a second. So, there is always a difference between winning the war and winning the battle. There's a lot of battles in a war, but it's about winning the war. So Daniel's, I'm gonna use, I think Daniel gave a great speech, so I'm gonna use that. He has a, his road up and down. The war, that's a journey, right? The battle is that sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I make more wrong decisions than I make right decisions. I'm absolutely aware of that but I'm very, very, very fond of, fond of making decisions and changing my mind again so that I get on the right path. John Caldwell, one of the richest guys in the UK, worth about four billion, uh, told me once, or pounds, um, told me once, he said, he's, um, he said to me, Mass, if I'm lucky, I only get recruiting wrong 70% of the time. That's a reflection of reality, that's a reflection of, look, I could also not make recruiting mistakes, but the only way to do that is what? To not hire people. It's a reflection of the willingness to make mistakes along the way. So highest standards. Standards is for whatever reason, I haven't been able to translate having the highest standards into something in Danish. So I think it's one of the areas that for those who are not Danish, by the way, the Danish language is much more small than English in terms of number of words. And so I haven't been able to find that, but just so everybody is aware, what does standards means, mean? Standards is what you have within you when if you do not live up to those standards, you feel really sick. Your stomach hurts, you feel weird. It feels like you're not on the right path. It feels like you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So we all have standards in all areas of your life. How many people know somebody who is probably really physical fit, but sort of career-wise, not very sort of ambitious? How many know a person like that? A lot of people do, right? And what does that mean? Does that mean they have low standards? No, it just means they have low career standards. It doesn't mean they have low standards for life necessarily. It doesn't mean they have low standards for their health. How many people have seen somebody maybe who is even really, really hard work and in really high ambitions for their career, but in really low and bad physical health, right? So we know those people as well. They're all looking at me, that maybe why I know. Um, so we all know those people as well. We also know people, so we have different areas of our lives and within each of those areas, we gotta have different standards. So the people with the highest standards win the war in whatever the war is. Not the battle, but the war. So if you look at somebody like Anthony Robbins, one of the world's biggest coach, he would say, you gotta raise your standards. It's all about raising your standards. It's the standards for discipline, it's the standards for um, how, how, uh, how much risk you're willing to take, it's the standards for your life, it's the standards for whatever it is. So it's all about standards. If you're gonna take one thing away from today, I just wanna take away this. Realize what your standards are in each area, and then realize if they're aligned with the purpose that you have or the goals that you have for your life and then make sure you raise them so they reflect those goals and continue to raise them. By the way, your standards are impacted by the people you hang out with. If you hang out with people who are in good physical health, you tend to get in better physical health. If you hang out with people who are great at school, you tend to get better at school. You don't necessarily get as good, but you tend to be reflected. So be very wary of the commonality of the people that you hang out with for that particular purpose. And it's fine to have different role models for different areas. You don't need to have the same role model for every single area that you have in your life. So you can have a role model and a standard for a certain aspect and to say, this guy over here, he's, you know, he has no job, but I wanna be like him from a health standard. 
So you got to do things 150%, and I didn't do this. So this is one of my big mistakes. You've got to do things 150%, because that's the only way you really learn. If you just do 50% of the, th the things 50%, you don't learn from it. Do it 150% and then do less things, right? But you've got to do things all the way through because you get the end-to-end -end knowledge of how to complete and do tasks. And I don't care if that's building a company or if it's our relationship, if it's, a, if it's our pet or if it's our kids, whatever it is, we've got to do things 150%. Um, a friend of mine um, was very lucky, so he grew up with some money. Um, unfortunately, that didn't exactly inspire him as it does with some people um, to work hard. In fact, it probably inspired him to do the opposite. So he decided to drop out of, out of high school, um, which was a shame because he was a, he was a very bright kid. He spent this money over a certain amount of years until I believe he was 25 years old. And then he finally had to get a job because he had no more money left. And he decided to take a job in a, in a call center, a certain organization in Denmark. And he came to me and said, look, I want to I wanna make something out of my career. I want to do more than the others. What can I do? And I said, it's very simple. Work one hour more than everybody else in the company, or at least in your peer group. And he did that. He had no education, didn't finish high school. It's about uh, five, six years ago now. He managed about four or 500 people in the company now. He's the highest ranked person without a university, even a, even a, even a, a, a high school degree in the entire company, which is a very big Danish company. He earns, a, he earns millions of kroner a year. He's a very successful guy. But it's a very simple principle, work an hour more. Why is that? Because if you think about the work that you do in a company, this much is administration, just getting into the job, getting into the office, all this kind of stuff. This little is actually value add. And so if you double that or if you work an hour more, it's a massive amount of extra value add time that you actually get in your job. It's the same for me. Just getting up to speed with my companies take a certain amount of time. If I actually spend more time in the companies, then I get a lot more value out of it because it's, it's actually the time where the business really grows or we grow as people as well as so we learn and develop. You've got to stand out. If you're, not, if you're looking to blend in, you're not going to stand out. If you blend in, you're not going to be the 0.001% that I'm looking for in creating 100 million kroner of wealth for you in the next 10 years. You need to be willing to stand out. And that requires the following. That requires that you piss off people along the way. Because that's required to create impact. I'm not saying I'm an angel. I'm not saying that everybody likes me by far. In fact, I'm sure there's more people that probably don't than there are that do. I'm just interested in the people who like me, that they like me a lot, and then some people don't. That's okay as well. I'm going to piss people off along the way. That's the only way to create impact. How many here know Elon Musk? Does anyone here think that people who work with Elon Musk who say he's a great guy or a nice guy? They would say he's fucking smart. He's hardworking as hell, and he learned more than anything else, right? But he's pissed a lot of people off in the process as well. But that may be required to be the 0.001% that you want to be in the world. You've got to dream big. If we don't dream big, we're not going to go for it. I think the one, number one thing that I find missing at CBS today is that dream. Is that dream to say, I want to be the CEO of ISS. I want to build a $100 billion company. I want to make $100 million over the next 10 years. And I don't just mean dream. I mean, you have to go for it as well. You have to raise your standards and all the other stuff we just talked about. But you've got to have the dream. And so this guy I met on the way here, and that's one of the reasons why I decided to include this slide, is I met this guy, and he's a really great guy, and I like him, and he's really smart. But his dream was so limited. It was unbelievable. And I don't want to say the company that works for him. He works in the M&A department of a Danish company, right? He was just, he set the bar for his life down here already. And he doesn't need to. Maybe if you come out of Surrey, you've fled war and all these things. Maybe you have to because that's realistic. But your realistic world is much, much bigger. In fact, because people don't set their dreams very high, unfortunately, in this country, the ability for you to achieve them is even bigger. I also joked around with it and said, thank God that you don't dream as big because you're harder working and smarter than I am, so I'm happy to be alone. You've got to understand risk and you've got to take calculated risk. I've tried over the years to recruit people out of McKinsey. In Denmark, I have a company called Samlino, um, which has done um, really, really well. Um, Christian, who runs some Linus today, he used to work for McKinsey and Company here in Denmark. He wasn't, and he knows that, he wasn't the first guy I tried to get from McKinsey to run the company and build the company with me in Denmark. In fact, he was probably number five, just because I didn't meet him until very late. But the other four or five people said no. Why did they say no? Because they said it's risky. I disagree. I don't think building a company with 100 million kroner in funding is risky. Will it fail? Maybe. 
Can you go back to McKinsey tomorrow? Absolutely. Would McKinsey like you more if you've been out there hiring 100 people, building a business, doing deals, doing marketing, et cetera, than they do if you just spend another six to 12 months in McKinsey? Of course they would. It's risky if you don't go for it. It's risky if you don't apply yourself. It's risky if you don't um, raise your standards. But it's not risky if you go for it 150%, because even if it fails, you're actually a better person than you were in the, in the other trajectory you're really going to go on. So what I'm trying to say is not just to take risk and close your eyes. What I'm trying to say is take calculated risk. Think through and say, OK, what's going to happen if I do well? What's going to happen if I fail? What is the expected return of that versus the trajectory I'm on? Focus on questions, not answers. Answers are really easy to come by if you ask the right questions. So in all the speeches I ever do, I always include this because I think it's one of the most important things in my life, which is asking and answering questions. Right? So the process of thinking is the process of asking and answering questions. That's the process of thinking. Usually I will stand here and I will say, what is it to think? And everybody will come up and say a bunch of different things. And I will say, well, what we're doing right now is thinking. I'm asking your question. You're trying to come up with an answer. And that may happen verbally and sort of extroverted, right? So we may say it, or it may happen in our head. But there is an American, or I guess English saying, that says, ask and you shall receive. Exactly. Ask and you shall receive. And why is that? Because question works like blinkers. They focus your attention. They focus in the direction that you look. And so if you're asking a question saying, why is this guy so annoying, you're going to get an answer to that question. If you say, what the fuck can I learn from this guy, you're going to get a different answer. I see sometimes you know, people in our companies, they look at competition and say all the things they're doing wrong. They're not asking the question, what can I learn from this person? What can I take away? What can I apply tomorrow? So the answer you're going to get is an answer that reflects your question more than your ability to find the answer. And we ask horrible questions all the time. I at least do. Maybe you guys are better. I ask horrible questions all the time. So what I try to be aware of is the quality of the questions that I ask. And so our idea Anthony Robbins says the quality of our lives is determined by the quality of the questions that we ask. Because it works like blinkers and it puts a direction on our view. You should only worry about one thing, and that's adding massive amount of value to the world. Some people say, probably not in the left wing ring of our government, but some people would argue that you get paid for the value that you add in the world. In fact, they would argue and say you cannot sell a product or service without adding value, assuming that, the, that you haven't lied to the person. Because the reality is you produce something, that person is willing to give you money, and if they're willing to give you money, that means you must have added value to them, because nobody gives rid of money just because they think it's fun. This doesn't have to be for money, adding value to the world. That could be in all sorts of ways. But the people who build the biggest companies in the world adds massive amount of value to the world. Does that mean they add more than the, uh, Linda, uh, um, the, the, the Gates Foundation? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. But it definitely means they're adding a lot of value. So the biggest thing you can do if you want to add a lot of value is either you go the NGO way, non-for-profit way, which is really good and fair, or you go the way of saying, I want to build a massive company because I want to add massive amount of value to the world. And this is what you have to focus on every single day that you're building a company or that you're building a career, how do I add mass, more value to the people around me? Learn the right stuff. There's three things I generally say you can learn. You can learn personal stuff, discipline, the way that you think, et cetera. You can learn functional stuff, capital raising, marketing, whatever it is, or you can learn industry-specific stuff. If you're at a conference and you would ask the audience, as I'm doing here, and you would say, what defines a great leader? So let me put that differently to you. If you go to school here, what you usually learn is functional stuff. When you start to join your work, you usually learn functional stuff, but you learn industry-specific stuff. When you ask people what do they want, to, what do they need to grow, they will usually say either functional-specific stuff or there's an industry-specific stuff. The irony is if you define what a great leader is, it very rarely comes out, he's great on marketing. He's great on capital raising. He's just really good at Excel modeling. That's why he's the CEO of Apple. What you usually end up with is stuff that defines him as a person, the psychology. Psychology tends to define success when we talk about leaders. 
And so the irony of school and university is we're more than anything not focused on psychology. We are in differences, right? Because we have to deliver work and we have to think through problems and stuff. But we never really discuss that in a school like CPS. What we actually end up discussing is either functional specific stuff or industry specific stuff. But psychology is what defines success more than anything else. And then you gotta have your non-work part as well. I don't build startups, I build companies. I always say that when people joke around and say, well, how many startups you build? I say, I don't build startups, I build companies. And the reason for that is I'm not building something for to be there temporarily. I'm not being there, building something to be there today. I'm building something I want to have there in 100 years from now. So I don't think about building a startup. I want to build a company. I want to build something permanent. Companies are permanent. Startups are things that we just do and we're loose about them and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. But I'm absolutely committed the, 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 the second I decide to do something. These are our enemies. Our enemies are not each other in school, it's nothing else. It's fear, it's ego, and it's complacency. Those are the people that we fight every day. I have this test that I have in, in, in for me, and we do it in our company, which is the empty chair test, which is you look at a chair next to you every single day at the end of the day, and you say, imagine there was a person sitting on this chair, and this person had exactly the same educational background as I have, exactly the same mindset, exactly the same everything else. If this was a competition today, did I beat this guy, yes or no? Because we can't think about our competition being some guy who doesn't have the, the, um, the standards and the opportunities that we have. We also can't say we're competing against Tim Cook or something because you know, he's just further ahead. But we gotta beat ourselves every day. And if we beat ourselves every day, that's all we can ask for. So watch out for these things and be very, very honest. And then last but not least, be really willing to ask for help. I do it 10, 30 times a day. I do it from mentors, I do it from coworkers, I do it from friends, I do it from vices, I do it from books. When I was at CBS, I had a huge array of mentors. I went to everyone I met, everybody I thought was smart, everybody I thought that could add value to my life. And I said, I wanna learn from you. And some people said no, and some people said yes. And the people that said yes, I tried to build a great relationship with them. And a lot of people wanna add value to your life, a lot more people than you think. And the younger you are, ironically, the more people want to add value to your life because they think you're still going to listen and still shapeable and all those things. So they feel like it's a really good impact of their time on the world as well. And if you dare, then reach out to me and I'm happy to try to help as well. Thank you very much.